Hello, this is Elisa Rodriguez, and this is the Arian Orthodox Church. And today we're going to be talking about a couple of things. Um, the first thing I want to get to is uh, dealing with an issue about Unitarianism and the problem that I have with Unitarianism because I see some issues in Unitarianism that <clears throat> Well, the problem for me mainly is is that Unitarianism begins with uh, normally when you're coming from Trinitarianism, answers to why the Bible says some things that are very non-Trinitarian, and you don't see the doctrine of the Trinity inside of the Bible, and you're starting to see contradict the doctrine of the Trinity. And one, first of all, goes to look for answers somewhere. The Arians, because usually when you're searching for um, an answer to Trinitarianism and finding what is the opposite of Trinitarianism or what is the alter, al alternative to go to, Trinitarianism didn't exist as a way to go. Je Jehovah's Witnesses are... Um, very much similar to what Arianism is, although there's some, um, but normally people don't want to go towards Jehovah's Witness because there's so many other things that have, they have a problem with, not being able to take communion or being able to take communion, but it being seen as a much more bigger thing, baptism, um, the 144,000, the prophecies. There's a lot of things about Je being a Jehovah's Witness. Being kind of, I think it sounds like, it may not be this way, but it looks like there would be a lot of looking down on you or fear of being uh, kicked out of being Jehovah's Witness. I don't know. There's a lot of stuff there. On top of that, um, their belief system about Michael, the archangel, um, and Jesus being the Michael, the archangel, that kind of stuff that is an issue for someone who's a Trinitarian and walking away from doctrine to coming out and going towards um, something else. Tr uh, Jehovah's Witness does not seem like the right decision to make. You look online, you look everywhere else, and you find Unitarianism or Socinianism or Ebionite ism uh and you wonder well what's what's with that and so unitarianism or socinianism or being ebionite is the the belief system that jesus did not exist he came out of mary's body so so when they look at it like anthony buzzard and uh, some other ones they look at the very only at Matthew and Luke as authoritative to tell you anything about whether about Jesus. Some of their arguments, and um, and so that's normally where people go to. They gravitate towards that. I mean, even Jehovah's Witnesses who are leaving Watchtower Society go towards Unitarianism because there's no should be there is not big enough or well known enough for people to go towards that as opposed to other places. Arianism is so, um, it's, it's not an organized religion like the rest of them are. So it's very difficult to, there's so few that are organized together. So they automatically go towards Unitarianism predominantly. And some people who understand the word and are studying very, very intently realize that Unitarianism is not the answer, realize that Jehovah's Witnesses is not the answer, and Trinitarianism is not the answer, and they hover in this. These are the Arians who understand the balance to not go too far one direction or another. When you understand the doctrine of the Trinity is not true, you automatically assume any nothing is true about the doctrine of the Trinity. 
you say to yourself, okay, well, if the doctrine of the Trinity is not true, and the Father and the Son, there's no Trinity, um, and I see the Father as the, as the only true God, you start throwing away everything else. Like, okay, Jesus is not God, so let's cut him out. So that means that he's just born logically, right? He's just born through Mary. He's just a man, and he died for us, and he's not. Because you automatically think, okay, well, the, there's there's some things that I have to cut out now from the doctrine of the Trinity. I have a, you know, a Trinitarian or, or, or soon to be ex Trinitarian is saying, I've uh, allowed all of these lies to tell me these different attributes. And I want to encourage anyone who's feeling like they're transitioning from one position to the other, or from Trinitarianism to something else um, or on the fence that not to just go automatically into Unitarianism because it's a logical, carnal answer and it just makes sense, but it's not biblically true. It's a problem. So when you, dis when you find out that doctrine of the Trinity is not true, the most important thing you need to know as a Trinitarian who's leaving Trinitarianism, the most important thing that you need to know is that Jesus is not existing God, okay? The God who has always existed, who is uncreated, who has always existed. This person who all things come through, that who all who created all things is God and before he by himself with no son to begin with so that's who God is that concept of the father who doesn't have any children yet who has always existed who is almighty all powerful that is God who has existed when no one else existed. So that's the main thing that you need to keep a hold of. Father is God Almighty and that he has always existed. So that's who God is truly. Now when you say, okay, now I'm going to take Jesus out of my concept of who God is. He's not the tr a trinity any further so i'm gonna have to take him out of the equation so once you take him out of the equation what do you do with him your answer the answer is is that all you have to do is just he's not the uncreated god don't you don't have to take away all these other attributes of him because they're still biblical there's a lot that's still there that's still valid for jesus but because you feel like, well, I have to take him away from being God, and so I have to take away all this other stuff as well, like pre-existence and other things like that. And that makes sense. It does. It makes sense that you want to take everything away that you gave him that kind of sounds like he's God. You want to take all that away. It sounds right, but it's throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Okay, so it's just saying, okay, I need to take all of this out without enough research. What you should be doing, or the, the rational way of looking at this um, and, and deciding how you're going to go about it is to just say, Jesus is not God. That's what I have learned. Through all the scriptures that you're reading and hearing and all that stuff, you're getting to a point to where you're saying, okay, I'm not seeing that Jesus is God. It looks like Jesus has a God. It looks like God is someone else, and someone else God other than Jesus. Um, so what you need to do is just realize that Jesus is not the God, God Almighty. Um, <clears throat> so the problems with Unitarianism, really quickly. So like I'm saying, you're moving away from Trinitarianism. You're trying to find out what am I going to do with Jesus now? What you're going to do with Jesus, what you should do with Jesus is just take away the notion in your mind that he is God Almighty. Um, <clears throat> and realize that Jesus is, the main thing you need to know is that Jesus is the firstborn of all creation. In 1 Colossians chapter, I'm sorry, 1 Colossians. 
uh, Colossians, there's no second Colossians. So Colossians chapter one, verse um, tells you that, let's see here, okay. So 15 says that he is the image of the invisible God and the firstborn of all cre creation. Firstborn. So first thing we're going to look at is why is this not Unitarian? And what is this telling us about Jesus? So first of all, why is this not Unitarian? So Unitarianism or Socinianism is, uh, and I say that because I look at I look at the camera this way because um, Unitarianism is is in for this belief system. It's Socinian or Ebionite because they want to uh, because this is truly who they are. That's who they were in the old uh, when the church was around way back when. People called the Ebionites, and that's what they believed that Jesus was only a man and all of that but let's keep in mind that the church said they were heretics they were wrong this is before the council of nicaea so trinitarians are not ruling the church right now arians are and they said look those guys are heretics that's not truth right there they are only believing jesus is is this you know born through mary so let's not keep him uh, with that pre-existence. So, and the church realized and recognized very early on that they were not who they were, who the church was. They weren't part of the church and they excluded them. So this is what this belief system is, which is called today Unitarianism. So they believe that Jesus only came at Mary. So in this verse, it says that he is the firstborn of all creation. So the problem for Trinitarianism, which is the other side, is that Trinitarians say that Jesus is uncreated, has always existed, co-eternal, right? So that means he's also eternal, like the Father, which is impossible. Um, the problem with being co-eternal is that if the Father and the Son are always have always existed, both of them have always existed, then really... The Father isn't the Father of the Son because no one made the Son. No one started the Son. The Son has always existed. So that's one eternal being and another eternal being. More, they're friends because they can't even be related, can't even be called related um, because one has always existed, the other one has always existed. I guess they are related because they'd be joined at the hip like Siamese twins. So I guess it's impossible to say they're not related, um, but they're they're like Siamese twins though. They're stuck together, and they can't be separated, but they're not each other. So that that's not a father son relationship. That's a brother brother relationship. To be absolutely honest, that's what Trinitarianism says. Even though that's not what they want to say, that's not literally what they're saying. But that's what they if you analyze what they're saying. And we thought of or came to the concept and accepted the concept of the Trinity and looked at the individuals, you wouldn't call them father, son. Because a father means he's birthed the other one or started the other one. And that's not Trinitarianism. That's not what Trinitarianism is trying to say. It's saying this one is God and this one is God and this one's the father. Of this one, even though they're Siamese twins and have always existed as long as the other one has. Son relationship. A father-son relationship has to have a father who brought this other one into existence and he looks like the father. That's a father-son relationship. So that's the problem with Trinitarianism and this verse. Another part of the verse that's a problem for Trinitarianism is who is the image of the invisible God? So it's saying that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. In other words, it's like a picture, right? Or a resemblance. <coughs> so if we look at, if I had a twin, right? So my twin would be the image of me, 
but would not be me, okay? So if I have a twin, my twin is an image of me, but is not me. It's a different person. Cannot be said to be the same human. Humanism wants to say that these two beings are the same God, that word God is talking about species, that these both of these are God. For a twin, um, even, even a Siamese twin, they're not the same person. And this one may look like this other one. And so if this is the image of another, then you're not saying he's the other. But this is saying the image of the invisible God. So there is a God who cannot be seen. And this God who cannot be seen, this is the image of. Now, if Jesus and the Father are together, the same God, Jesus couldn't be seen either because Jesus would also be the invisible God. So the problem for Trinitarianism is that it's not saying that Jesus is God because you wouldn't say for me or for you, if I were to say that you are the image of yourself, that's improper. You are not the image of yourself. You are yourself. There is no replication or alluding to not necessarily the right original. You are the original. So if I had a statue of you and I had you, this statue would be the image of you, but you are the original. I would not call you an image of yourself if you are standing right in front of me and I'm talking about you. So when the Bible is talking about Jesus, it says he's the image of the invisible God. So the invisible God is invisible and Jesus is the image of that invisible God. So I had somebody tell me one time when I was explaining something like this before in debate, they're kind of coming back and forth with me on Facebook. And they said, well, if visible God is, if the, if the God's image is invisible, then Jesus would be invisible as well, right? That Jesus would be invisible so that they're identical. Well, and that's not what it's saying. What it's saying is that Jesus is the image of the unseeable God cannot be seen, cannot be understood with the eye, talking about visually. So um, Jesus is the image. In other words, he is what we can see of what God looks like without looking at him. So the, the, the way this is, is, is like he's a mirror. And for God, so that Jesus is like a mirror reflecting the presence or image of God to the world. And that's why it calls Jesus, the Bible calls Jesus the mediator between God and man, which has its own Trinitarian problems and Unitarian problems as well. But he's the image of the invisible God. So he's a like a mirror reflecting the image of God. And so when we see Jesus, we're going to see God being reflected there, that Jesus is a person whom God has chosen to reflect his presence out, off of. Um, and so if you, the imagery, and what we're talking about is when Moses went up to the mountain and was up there for a long time and came back, he had the radiance of God glowing off of him that they actually had to put a veil over him just so that they could talk to him because it was just shining off of him. So Moses is not God, acting the image of God. Okay, so that's the imagery that we got. We need to get from Jesus. That Jesus is the image of the invisible God. He's reflecting the presence of God, the image of God to others, although he himself is not him. So same thing with Moses. Moses comes down. The typology is what we're getting from uh, how the shadow of things, how the Old Testament is the shadow of. The actual reality when Moses comes down it shows the glory of God the image of the light from God shining off of Moses and so you're seeing that he's reflecting the image of God but he's not God um, same thing with Jesus so and because it calls him God he calls him the image of God it shows that he's not God 
Um, and then it, he is the firstborn, though, of all creation. So, so now we put this verse together, and we see what the problem is with Trinitarianism. He is the image of the invisible God. He is not the invisible God, but an image of him, a reflection or a facsimile or a rep representation of God. The other half of the verse says that he is the firstborn of all creation. So Trinitarianism doesn't believe that he was created, doesn't believe that he is born at all. I mean, they, they call him the only begotten of the Father, um, only begotten Son, all of that. But they don't really believe that because they also believe that he's never had a moment of inception or start. He's never started. He's never began. He's always existed. So that's not Trinitarianism. So we're moving on from there to what are the problems with Unitarianism? Um, in Unitarianism, we have the um, where it says the first, the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. So now you're having um, Unitarianism who believes that he came only at Mary and only came when Mary birthed him. And we see this verse and it says, He's the firstborn of all creation. So Unitarianism wants to say that through Mary, and they, they point at Matthew where it says the beginning or the origins of the generations of Jesus, uh, you know, the, the, the life and his family, right, the, the lineage, the genealogy. And they say, well, this is what it's saying, that Jesus was born and began right here. It doesn't say anything about him existing beforehand and we don't see that at all in any of the matthew or luke we don't see that evidence there so <clears throat> from what i read about the historian eusebius of caesarea he said he brought down a story from his church histories about how the all of the gospels were making their way through the church and he had not made his yet and he, where the apostle John said, I'm going to write in a, a gospel that tells the other half of the story because the whole story about Jesus starts at when he was baptized by John the Baptist. All the stories start afterwards, and we didn't hear about what happened beforehand, and I'm going to explain that. And so John felt, John the Apostle felt like there was a lot missing from the other Gospels. So he started writing his Gospel last, and he wrote to close the problems that he saw in the, um, in the other Gospels, that he wanted to fulfill the rest of the answers to what the story of what Jesus, what we need to know about Jesus. So... Essentially, to me, it, I, I, it seems like the Unitarians want to say that true gospel, they want to be able to ignore the whole gospel of John. Yeah, because whenever you ask someone like Anthony Buzzard or anyone else like that about John, they want to say, well, look at Matthew and Luke. I don't see anything about it. So what do we do? We're not the whole gospel and all everything to know about Jesus is not in only Matthew and not in only Luke. It's not. But what they're saying is, and this is their tactic, is to say, well, since I don't see it in Matthew and Luke, it's not true. Or it's not what it means. That's not what the intended. But it's very simple. And we're going to look at issues and problems with Unitarianism. But. So we see the verse, uh, 1 Colossians, and, and you see the argument about how Jesus is, is through Mary only from because of Mar Matthew and Luke. So now we look at Colossians, and Paul now is a problem for them because he's saying that he's the firstborn of all creation. And so the main issue is they say, well, it's talking about uh, firstborn of all creation. I I'm trying to remember their their explanations about why they, uh, what their excuse is. The firstborn, oh, oh, oh. So a guy named uh, John Rivers used to tell me that um, the reason he's the firstborn is because it's talking about the new creation. 
in the new earth he is the firstborn of <clears throat> talking about resurrection and and so i think that's pretty funny because that's not honestly to what's to what the problem is in colossians they honestly do i mean that's not the way to read the bible and that's honestly the way that they make an answer for what's happening here firstborn being the firstborn of the new kingdom the new world um <clears throat> verse is where Unitarianism that theory falls apart because the next verse says um, for by him all things uh, were created that are in heaven and on earth visible and invisible whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers all things were created by him and for him so all things were created for by him all things were created to pretend like it's just talking about the new creation that's not what this verse is talking about because the ne very next verse it's got the word all in it all creation so all the things that are considered created okay and it doesn't if it was going to be what they're explaining as far as Jesus being the first in the new creation the new heaven and new earth that Jesus is the first if that's what really was being relayed here in this verse, it would say that he is the firstborn, that he is before all things. Let's see, uh, verse 16. For by him were all new things created. Then it would make sense if it said, for by him all new things were created. So then you would know only the new things, the new heaven, the new earth, are what he created or is created or God's creating through him through but it's not it's not categorizing or splitting up all of creation into new creation and old creation it doesn't it doesn't make that definition so because it this doesn't make that definition and Paul doesn't do that intentionally it means all of creation everything that has ever been made was he had a hand in all right for Unitarianism this verse is not going to support Unitarianism because it's talking about every single thing that's ever been created. Okay, so we're with that, that nothing in that verse, in those two verses, Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, 16, and even 17, none of those, none of those verses are supporting Unitarianism. It's not supported in those verses. And because of that, it's clearly not supported. So, so because of that, all of the other things that they're saying, as far as limiting Jesus to only existing after Mary, should be destroyed by now. Because you'll know for sure you're actually contradicting the Bible when it's describing Jesus. So if you're going to do that, and you're moving away from Trinitarianism, let's, let's go back to that understanding that you're leaving Trinitarianism, you're trying to find a place to go, Unitarianism sounds like a good idea. And these verses that I'm showing you are showing you that Unitarianism is not biblical. So you're not going to go that way unless you want to just accept, accept the Trinity, which is, I think, at fault. You've done enough research to realize that the doctrine of the Trinity is not true, and you're trying to walk away from it, but you don't want to go into another misunderstanding. Because in my view, uh, my personal opinion, I feel like Unitarianism is just as bad as Trinitarianism because it's they're both misunderstandings of who Christ is. And if you want to have a, a balanced view of who Christ is, you don't want to go all the way to Unitarianism because it's just too extreme. And I showed you a verse right there in Colossians where it proves that it's not biblical. So it's not worth going down that road that it's not supported by the Bible, you'd have to explain away so much just in that one verse. So the next part that I think is really important is to look at Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, uh, verse, let's see here, verse 10. So we're, we're really looking at, you're walking away from Trinitarianism, you're trying to find a place to go, Unitarianism is not going to be the answer. So the next verse that I find that has a problem, 
is verse 10. Um, it says, And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thine hands. Thou remainest, and they all shall wax old as doth a garment. As And as a vesture uh, shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed, but thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. Put this in a different version, because it's not, definitely not the English-friendly version. Okay. So, and thou, Lord, in the beginning didst lay the foundations of the earth. So, and it's talking about Jesus here. It's not talking about the Father. So if we look up at verse, um, verse 8, it says, But to the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God. And don't get tripped up by that. Jesus can be called God, but it doesn't mean he's the most high God, and I'll show you. But in verse 8 it says, But but of the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever, and the scepter of un of uprightness is the scepter of thy kingdom. And thou shalt, and thou, in verse 9, thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, talking about Jesus, therefore, God, thy God, talking about his God, who is the Father, has, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. So in that verse, it's talking about the psalmist is calling Jesus God. In this verse, um, in Psalms, so it's showing you that it's talking about the Son, and so it talks about one Psalm, and then it jumps down in verse ten to another Psalm or another portion of a Psalm, and it says, "And thou, Lord, didst in the beginning didst lay the foundations of the earth." It's still talking about the Son. So in the beginning, the Son laid the foundations. Obviously, God is operating through Jesus. But it's talking about Jesus being there and participating. So for Unitarianism, they're saying Jesus didn't exist before. He existed as a plan or a design or some sort of blueprint. Jesus himself. But this verse in Hebrews, the Hebrews writer, which is believed to be Paul, is, is saying that Jesus was at the beginning and that he laid the foundations of the earth. That is also contradicting what Unitarianism is saying. Unitarianism is oversimplifying who Christ is. They're saying Jesus is just a man who was born through Mary and he just exists here and is, you know, being a prophet and being a man of God and he's being kind of called the Son of God because of a promise. Or I don't know exactly what their explanation is for that. What I'm trying to show you is is that Unitarianism is too simple. It's simplified too much. It's totally taken away the verses that talk about Jesus being preexistent. The issue is, because, it had, because the Bible does have verses that talk about Jesus existing in the beginning, this is the reason why Trinitarians made a mistake and over-assumed a lot. So, Unitarianism is oversimplifying Jesus into just born through Mary to them. And there's like, let's just make it simple. He's just born through Mary and let's end that whole story. And Trinitarians, they elevated Jesus because of these other issues, because of him having verses called, you know, with his preexistence and things like that. They overassumed. So it's extremely, these, both of these, the theologies are extremity are extremes, extremely uh, over spiritualized or extremely over carnalized. It's one way or the other. It's not balanced. They're just over adding too much to Jesus and saying, "Well, he's God." Then, if he's lived so long, if he was at the beginning, if he had a hand in creation, then he is God. He is. We have to add them together because there's only one God, right? The the Shema, where it's uh, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. So they're like, okay, he was at the beginning and he had a hand in the creation, so we need to add them together and make them both gods somehow because so many things. He's not a normal human being. He's got these extra attributes that make him special. 
they out of their confusion they come up with this both of them are God and then later on they added the the Holy Spirit originally at Nicaea they didn't even add the Holy Spirit it was just Jesus and the Father that was true binitarianism people like to say that in the first church before Nicaea they were binitarian but in actuality binitarianism didn't start until after Nicaea when they only had the Father and the Son as God it wasn't a new thing it was it was a new thing that they were doing and that's where binitarianism actually starts if you look at pre Nicaea it was all Arianism so that's where true binitarianism starts and then it ends when they add the Holy Spirit and then you have your Trinity so so that is the problem and that's what Trinitarianism is doing is over adding to Jesus adding Jesus to God because of all these other attributes that he has in the Bible but that's never given to us that's never taught in the Bible that Jesus is part of God and so because of that they added to the Bible. They added to who Jesus was. And Unitarianism is taking away. So what I'm showing you is why in this verse is Unitarianism is not supported. That's not supported through these verses. And so if you're walking away from Trinitarianism and you're wanting to look for a place to find a home, the best place to find a home in is Arianism because it's, it's weighing out all of the verses, okay, and it's it's got a healthy balance. It's not going too extreme on one side or the other. It is taking the word, the Bible, as it's describing Jesus and accepting what it's saying about Jesus, but not adding to the extremes and bringing him to God's level, because it never does that. Nor are we taking away because we feel like it's too spiritualized or we can't get, wrap our heads around someone existing so long or whatever Unitarianism's problem is, oversimplifying Jesus. <clears throat> because when you don't have a proper view of who Jesus is and who God is, always you're going to have misunderstandings and you're going to stumble on things. So for an example... Um, Adam and Eve, or the serpent was talking to Eve and saying, you know, indeed hath God said, you can't eat from this tree. Um, and essentially he's questioning whether or not it's true. Why is he asking her whether or not it's true? If you examine that story, you find out that only Adam heard what about the tree. God never told Eve directly what not to eat from the tree. She heard it from Adam. She heard the instructions from Adam. And when she told what she understood about what God had said through Adam, the serpent was saying, did God really say that? If God had told her right away in her face, if God had directly spoken to her, she would have a question and say, of course he said so. I was there. I heard him. But the reason he's asking to say that is because she didn't hear it firsthand. And she heard it from Adam. So that's one of the ways that the devil will try to, to attack women is to have them question or someone a man and saying, hey, are they lying to you or they or someone else? It really doesn't have to be husband or wife. It, it, anyone else. If someone else tells you, God told me this about you or the Bible says this, if you didn't hear it directly from God within, the devil can say, is that really true or not? And, and kind of mess with you in that way. So that's what he was doing to her. It was not accurate. She said, of the trees of the garden we can eat, but we can't eat this one that you're asking about, and we can't even touch it. Well, that's not absolutely true. The Bible only said you can't eat it. It didn't say you couldn't touch it. You could, you could throw it away. You could really do anything you wanted to with it except eat it. You could make wallpaper with it. I mean, I don't know what you could do with it, but you could do anything you wanted to with it, just not eat it, touch it. 
So the problem with that understanding, and I'm not saying that this is what happened in the Bible, but I want you to get an understanding about why not understanding clearly enough will cause a problem. If Eve was underneath the tree, kind of hanging out, drinking coffee with the serpent, let's say, and one of these fruits fell off and bumped her in her head, okay? It fell right on her head and it touched her, and she didn't intentionally touch it, and she believed that if she touched it, she would die. If she, because she believes wrongly, and let's say that this fruit fell on her or touched her somehow, because she doesn't understand the command correctly, she would automatically think, well, I didn't die and nothing's happened, so maybe I can eat it because I touched it and nothing happened. But she didn't realize that God never said not to touch it. But her misunderstanding could confuse her into thinking that all of what she heard about it is wrong now because she assumed that it's, I couldn't touch it and I touched it and I didn't die. Everything's just fine. So maybe I can eat it also. That's what happened in the Bible, but I'm giving you that analogy or that story to give you an understanding of how misunderstanding the truth of the Bible, even slightly, problems a domino effect in your theology, like with Trinitarianism, where they said, okay, well, um, there's only one God, and Jesus is said to exist in the beginning, so he's God. And all those dominoes that fall in that direction, and you understand, and you totally destroy who Jesus really is. Or if you come on this side and say, for Unitarianism and say, okay, well, Jesus only existed after Mary. Jesus never pre-existed. That's the truth. And just go with that misunderstanding. Everything else is going to have a slight distortion to the truth because you're adding to it something that's not given. So eventually you're going to grow into more and more confusion. So Trinitarians went all the way to the, to the point of being two other people to who God is, or two other names to who God is. On Unitarian side, you start off with saying, okay, Jesus was divinely born through Mary, but then they evolve. If you look at Unitarianism, it evolves later on. You'll see greater and greater levels of, extre of extremes in Unitarianism to where they start saying that Jesus of Joseph, where they start saying that Joseph and Mary had a child and it turned out to be Jesus and that's who Jesus is and all of that stuff. Because they're starting to take away from the power of God and the, and the ability of God to do, transform, transform one person to another or that Jesus existed at the very beginning. They can't wrap their heads around that. They're too carnal for that. His pre-existence and because they're on that trajectory of taking away things from Jesus that are too divine or too spiritual for them, away the divine birth and say that Joseph and Mary had a kid and his name was Jesus, and that and because they're used to the scripture the way it's saying and twisting it in some amazing ways. Um, and I point out again this guy, uh, River. Uh, I think his name is John Rivers. If you look at the way he describes and debates, he's all over the place. And he, he it doesn't matter what the verse says, he can find a way to twist it in amazing ways. Um, so what I'm saying is, is that we're looking for the truth. And if you're looking for a place to go from Trinitarianism, warning you that Unitarianism has lots of problems and that's not where you want to go. So another thing about Unitarianism is John chapter 1, verse 1, because they say that Unitarianism is the word in John chapter 1, verse 1, is a blueprint or an idea or a thought of God. It's some kind of plan of God, but it's not Jesus. So if we start looking at it deeper, there's issues. So the word 
in verse 4 is a lie. So not only is it something, for them it's a plan, but this plan is alive. So now you have a living plan, and what that means to Unitarianism, I don't know. If you have a living plan, that means it's alive. Certainly it has a personality of some kind. It's not just a life that doesn't speak or say, or I mean, what what is alive to a Unitarianism? Uh, to Unitarianism to say that it's 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 something that's not a person but is alive. I don't know how that's going to work. For us, we understand that the word is Jesus, so being alive makes sense because he is a person and he's alive. So that's one thing. And then in that verse four, it says, "In him was life, and the life was the light of men." So when I understand that this life was the light of men, it's I feel like it's saying it gave light to men, like it like the life that it has gave us life. Light, right? Opened our eyes, gave us the ability to see. So that's what I what I read there when it says, and in him was life, talking about him having life, having existence, being a person. So in him was life, and this life, this existence, this person was the light of men. In other words, it gave life to men. That, that's where we came from. That's where we got our life from. Um, so that part of Unitarianism is not going to work because this thing is not just a plan thing. Then we go down further. It talks about um, in my is that from John chapter one verse one all the way down to jo to verse fourteen, it's talking about the word. It's not talking about anybody else. It does mention John the Baptist for a minute, but then it goes back to the word being the light and the light. Of, you know, he came into the world and the word world was made through him. All of this. So <clears throat> when it says that that he was in the world and the world was made through him. And then you look at the verse that we looked at to begin with, Colossians, where it says all things were made through him or came through him. All things. And it talks about the same thing about the word, using the same description that all things came into existence through him. We are Is Unitarianism, the answer to Unitarianism is that the word is not Jesus. But both of these descriptions, the one about Jesus explicitly and the word, are both being said to be who through all things came into existence. So maybe Unitarianism thinks that two things made all things, and they're not God. Um, so I don't know exactly how that's supportable in their minds, Unitarianism, but if all things were made through this being, this living word and all things were made through Jesus, it said. To me, it sounds like it's who Jesus is. And the more ironic thing, word turned into the flesh that is Jesus. I mean, it's turned into the flesh, turned into Jesus. But that's still not Jesus to them. Doesn't make any sense. But this is where Unitarianism is. Um, this is why I have a problem with Unitarianism. And, and you or anyone moving away from Trinitarianism or any other belief system into this Christology of non-Trinitarianism and trying to find a place where the truth is from here. Trinitarianism is not the place because it's definitely not supported by the Bible. So, and I'm saying Arianism is the best place because it does accept all of the verses the way they say it. We don't add to it. We're not taking away from it. We're accepting it as it is and we're moving forward with that understanding. So the last part, and this is, I feel like the nuclear bomb of this whole argument about whether Unitarianism is true or if that's the way it, the belief system is, um, I feel like this is what destroys even any possibility of Unitarianism being taken seriously. It says in verse, um, verse 12, verse 12 says, but as many as received him, talking about the word, for Unitarianism, 
uh, for Unitarianism, I, I believe that they would change that word him to it. Um, so, so it would say, but as many as received it for the for the Unitarians, it would probably say that. For as many as received it, to them gave it, I guess, the right to become children of God, even to them that believe on his name. So what it's saying, we need to examine this very seriously. It says that to as many as receive the word, that, that word gave them the right to become sons of God. So if Unitarianism is going to maintain that this word is not Jesus, okay? We know that the word is not Jesus in Unitarianism. So Unitarianism, you say that the word is not Jesus. And in verse 12, it says that as many as received this word became sons of God. If this is not Jesus, Unitarianism is saying that there is another way to become a son of God outside of needing Jesus. Okay? Because if they're saying that this is not Jesus, that means there's another way to become a son of God in verse 12 without Jesus. And that means there's two ways to God now. Because there is no other way whereby we are going to be saved. It's only through Jesus. There's no other way to become a son of God. There's no other way. The Bible is clear that Jesus is the only way. But if Unitarianism, who is using every extreme that they can and trying to twist the word and ignore the preexistence so much that they totally lost the fact that they're adding to the possibilities of becoming a son of God. Because that is exactly what it's saying. Verse 1 to verse 14 is all about the word that is in the beginning. And if that's not Jesus for them, they've added inadvertently a way to become a son of God without. So all we have to do if you're a Unitarian is find out what that word is and you don't even need Jesus. You just need to find out this blueprint. Once you find out this blueprint, this plan, this pre-existent blueprint plan thing, if you can figure that out, you could be a son of God without Jesus. Isn't that amazing? Or the word is Jesus and nothing is contradicting anything else, is still the only way whereby we are saved. So now you can see why it has to be Jesus. It has to be, the word has to be Jesus. Otherwise, you're making up a new way of becoming a son of God. And that's impossible because the Bible already says it's not possible. So, that whole thing should blow the mind of the Unitarian out of the water. I asked Anthony Buzzard this like three weeks ago, and I put it on every post he put um, in this Jehovah's Witness, um, uh, leaving Jehovah's Witness or ex-Jehovah's Witness group. I gave him this explanation and told him the problems with, I threw it to him in three or four different posts that he made in that group. And no answer from Anthony Buzzard at all on this, on this issue. He cannot deny that he's inadvertently added another way to God and no another way to become son of God if that's not Jesus. He, that is irrefutable. And he can't answer that. He will not answer that. Because it shows, it exposes how Unitarianism has absolutely no groundings in the Bible at all. This is their main argument, that Jesus is not the Word. And I've proven that Jesus is the Word. Say that Jesus is the Word. You're adding another way to become a son of God. That the, that the Bible is saying there's another way to be a son of God outside of Jesus. And it doesn't seem like they really care. I mean, I barely brought this up to him like three weeks ago, and he hasn't answered anything. So I'm assuming that he realizes that Unitarianism is false, and he's just going to keep teaching it anyways. I don't know. But if anybody wants to ask Anthony Buzzard, uh, what's this other way to becoming a son of God, and why is it not the word, feel free, because he's not answering it for me. 
Um, <clears throat> so if, um, if you have any more questions, because I want to give people who are wanting to understand um, Arianism, which is the most biblical view, and I'm saying most biblical, more supported by the Bible, because we take the word as it as it describes Jesus, as it, as it describes God, we take the whole counsel of the Bible and we stand on that and not to the extremes uh, of either Trinitarianism, Unitarianism, oneness. Um, all of those things are extremes that just don't make sense, that are not biblically supported um, and are not worth even honestly because you're going to have to eventually evolve out of that back to the middle, back to the center in a balanced view. So if you have any questions, you can contact me at um, er at arianismtoday.com. Um, visit us on our website, arianismtoday.com. We have um, a Facebook group called um, the Arian Orthodox Church on Facebook. It's a group. And then we have the Arian Orthodox Church page, which is where we do more promotional stuff and more outreach with that part. Um, if you have any questions about transitioning from Trinitarianism to another Christology or understanding the possibilities, um, feel free to ask. Feel, feel free to ask anybody in the group, and we'll definitely answer any of your questions. Um, <clears throat> how's it going, Andre? I, I see you there. Can you hear me? I think you got your mic. Oh, yeah. Hi. Yeah, I'm, I'm well, thank you. How are you? I'm very good. This is my um, wife, hello. Hello. <laughs> hey, um, congratulations on your uh, on the baby and everything. I hope everything's going well. Oh, yeah, thanks. <laughs> she's, she's, got, she's got a bit of a cold. So, oh, I hate yeah. that. <laughs> Well, I felt like it was a really important to look to touch on Unitarianism because we have been, I don't know, everybody seems to want to go, when they leave Trinitarianism or leave Jehovah's Witness, go to Unitarianism. And that, that frustrates me a whole bunch. So I, this is something that bothers me. Really? So, so whoever become uh, from Jehovah's Witnesses, they go to Unitarianism? So you be with the Unitarians is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, right. I've seen I've seen it happen where there's a lot of groups out there that are trying to get the attention of ex Jehovah's Witnesses because the Jehovah's Witnesses maybe uh, kicked them out or, or decided not what to allow them to be in their group anymore, and then they they're looking for somewhere else to go to church. To Unitarianism says, come with us because you can't go to a Catholic church, you can't go to a Trinitarian church because the way you believe. So they say, well, let's go to, you know, Unitarianism, and that's where they go, and that's where they stay. That's strange, because because really they should come to us, because we believe, similar what JW believe, but obviously but we believe that Jesus is Jesus, not an archa, my, uh, angel Michael is Michael. So this is only like small differences. They should come to us. We believe in pre-existence of Christ. So, so do they? Why would they join uni Unitarians who don't believe in pre-existence of Christ? I don't understand that. You ne we need to fish them out from there. Maybe, maybe they're not aware that we exist. You know, maybe. Not. I think that's what's happening. I think that's what's happening. We're so small right now. We're just barely trying to grow. I think that's what's happening. Is that they're not. They know. They're not knowing that there's something to go to. Yeah. I'm sure that a lot of them want to take communion a lot of them want to do baptism and they yeah. can't in jehovah's witnesses and it's i think it's just something they're missing out on but i've noticed we have jw's i think we've got gareth then we've got santonio uh somebody else and um they jw's but a lot of them i see that's those that believe in pre-existing for some reason they're not actually Aryans like me and you i don't know how many <laughs> actually uh people like me and you who believe that jesus is jesus you know there are many who believe in the pre-existence of christ uh those who deny trinity but the way we believe like me and you 
I don't know who else is there. <laughs> you know, the well, the that... one person, two people that I know, two other people that I know that believe like we do is Ron Tim, right? Yeah. John Robinson. So they don't believe in that Jesus is Michael. No. Oh, right. Okay. Good. Right. Oh, and then we have that um, that Israel that what was that website? The Restoration Ministry. Oh yeah, yeah. So they believe the same. They just don't. Um, they have the. They're very legalistic as far as as everything, but they still believe the same way. Mm. Well, we should work with them, maybe. Um, you mean legalistic? You mean like they still follow the rituals and sacrifices or something? Yeah, they still do do all that. They believe in doing the the Passover and all of those rituals, mm -hmm. which I feel is not wrong for Jewish Christians to do. Yeah, for Jews. I mean, I mean, if 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 a Jew like an Orthodox Jew, like one of the uh, one of the guys that joined us before, he is an Orthodox Jew. But if he wants to look into Arianism, I wouldn't stop him uh, from doing the rituals that he's meant to do, as long as he accepts Christ. And uh, he becomes, you know, one of us. And then, then he, if he if he wants to celebrate, you know, was it Tanaka? Is it Tanaka? Is it Tanaka that they celebrate? You know, Hanukkah. Hanukkah, Hanukkah so yeah, it's Hanukkah. Yeah, yeah Hanukkah. <laughs> yeah, you know, if he wants to celebrate that, the bowel means, you know, it's it's a Jewish tradition. I wouldn't stop anybody doing that. If you want to get circumcised, well, that's fine. But if you're Christian, you don't have to do it because I'm yeah, not. that's the thing. That's the thing about, and that's the interesting thing about. And I have never made a video on this, and maybe I'll make a video someday yeah. about this. But Christianity, um, in the old, in the New Testament, in Acts, the Jews who were Christians first started trying to make the Gentile Christians obviously circumcised and become Jews. Mm like all of us understand how Jews exist. But then they had the council in Jerusalem where Peter was talking about his side of the story. Paul was talking about his side of the story. And they said, okay, we're only going to put these few, few laws on the Gentiles. Don't drink blood from, mm -hmm. don't um, eat food sacrificed to idols, no sexual immorality. Um, I think no murder. I, I'm not sure exactly, but there were very few the Jewish Christians later on when Paul comes back to Jerusalem and talks to James who is the leader of the church in Jerusalem and I think the leader of all the apostles um, which is re really kind of strange because he's not an apostle from what I understand mm. of Jesus what happens is they go back and they talk about how all the Jews are zealous for the law and so they're following the law 100% mm. and the Gentiles, how they're doing really good, and he's got a lot of people going to Christ in the Gentiles' world. But when Paul comes back, um, there's a story in Gen in uh, Galatians where it talks about where Paul meets uh, Peter, James, and John. I think it's Peter, James, and John, and they talk about their ministries, where they talk about how they recognized how Paul was a apostle towards the uncircumcised, mm. which are all Gentiles, uncircumcised. And mm. Peter, James, and John were saying that they're going to be preaching to Israel and that they're going to be preaching to the circumcision. So that's their ministry. So the apostles, the 12 apostles, I believe, preached only to Jews. Only to Jews. I don't think they went outside of Judaism to preach. Paul and Barnabas, I believe, are the only ones who went out outside of that realm and started preaching to the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. Timothy, along with him, obviously, um, I think, uh, I think Jude was with him as well. But those those guys were preaching to the Gentiles, and all of the other apostles were preaching to the Jews because that's who Jesus went to. Mm -hmm. If you look at it in this, when Jesus, I'm sorry, when uh, when Paul visits the Jews in Jerusalem before he gets captured and taken away and all that stuff, I think we're in verse chapter 21 or 22 when when Paul comes back and they say, look, um, 
all the Jews are worried that you're telling Jews outside of Israel to not circumcise. They're saying, that's what you're saying, Paul. And Paul's like, they're saying, so, so what we want to do is we want you to go do this ritual, uh, the Jewish ritual of cleansing at the temple. And I want you to pay for the, for these guys in their Nazarite vows. Mm -hmm. And so he goes and does that. And what this is showing is that the Jews themselves still circumcised, mm -hmm. still went the Christian Jews still circumcised, mm -hmm. still did ritual cleansings, still did the temple, still did all of those things. Mm -hmm. If they were Levites, all that stuff, they were still doing all the Jewish things that Jewish people should be doing. But all the Gentiles were not. So when they asked Paul, they said, Paul, look, they're worried that you're telling Jews not to circumcise. We know that you're telling Gentiles not to circumcise because they're not under the law. They're not under the Jewish law, so we're not worried about that part of them. The Jews, though, we want you to tell them to circumcise. We want you to tell them to follow the Jewish laws. And so this is the Christian Jews. This is James telling Paul this. And I believe that Christian Jews, and I'm talking about blood born Jews, not people who wanted to become Jews, yeah, and, and, not people who Jews. Yeah, actual Jews, people who are in the line of Jewish of Abraham as far as bloodlines. Mm -hmm. Those people they can follow the Jewish rituals, even circumcision, all of that stuff, and it's Christian and it's okay. Mm -hmm. Gentiles, yeah. not at all. No. You can't be no. doing Passover Legally, in the Bible, you cannot be doing Passover unless you're circumcised in your flesh. Way, so it's 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 you can't do that. You can do the Lord's Supper, which is even better than doing the Passover because you're actually talking about Jesus and not the the symbol or the shadow of the reality, which is Jesus. Um, so it's the communion than to do the Passover, but. Mm. If Jews want to do that as well in the middle of their Passover service, right? Because the last bread, when they break it and they drink of the, the wine, is when Jesus did it in the ritual of Passover. That's when they recognize Jesus in their in their ritual. But for Christians, we just do the regular part where Jesus broke the bread and passed the wine around. I mean, it's that way. So that's the way I, I see the Bible, anyways. So, so, so what I think the next topic for you should be should be this, and what you can do once you've done sermon on this, uh, you can hear it, hear it, maybe on on Jewish, on Jewish Facebook groups, maybe maybe like uh, Jews for Jesus or uh, Messianic Jews. So, if once obviously they've listened to your sermon, they might agree with what you're saying, and then you obviously leave the link. Um, to Aryan Orthodox Church, so they could check it out, and hopefully they will see that we actually welcome them to do their rituals. We're not, you know, some with some Christians they say you can't be Jew and be Christian, you know, uh, you know, some they, they just say things like that, and I think it's really insulting, really, to to Jew. And we actually say, well, if you're Jew, we're actually happy for you to do all this Jewish stuff, all this Jewish ritual, but as long as you accept Jesus and follow His commandments. And then happy days that you know we wouldn't yeah that would free them and then they wouldn't also on top of that they wouldn't have to add they wouldn't have to accept a trinity no exactly exactly so it's even easier for them we kind of make sense i'm so happy like like i'm i feel a lot more relaxed in Aaron orthodox church because you know because i wasn't i wasn't too comfortable with with the trinity and then we just it, anything in our church is sensible logical I think, I think logic is very important when you explain some uh, somebody doctrine or beliefs because if it doesn't make sense, people just cannot accept it by belief. Well, they can do like Trinity you have to accept by belief. You can do, but it has to be a bit of both, and it has to be biblical. So we're not just making it logical because, you know, because we try to avoid certain verses in the Bible. It's logical because it's biblical. You know, James White. I've listened to a few. James White is is very good. Um, well, he's a d Trinitarian d defender. So, so the way he explained, he's very, he's very articulate. You know, he explained things. So I kind of I understand where he comes from. But again, again, it's not biblical what he's saying. 
And um, so when we explain what Arianism is, is what we believe, we believe in one God, pre-existence, which is exactly biblical. And uh, we can explain this to Jews and say, look, guys, you know, about memory, which is a really good point. You can say, well, you, you know, you, you meant to be taught this, but when you were a child, parents didn't teach you this because for whatever reason, you know, so there are so many similarities between the Arian Orthodox Church and, and Judaism. And the, the, the fact that Jews don't believe in Trinity, there is no Trinity in Old Testament. And the, the fact that they only believe in one person, God, and we do that. They, they believe in Messiah and we, we believe in Messiah. I mean, it's so, so logical, so biblical. And, you know, that's why I'm trying to promote it. And anybody wants to speak to me, ask questions, happy, I'm happy to answer. Yeah, I think that I think that our biggest group, the group that the biggest group that would come to us mm. would be Jewish. I think the biggest group that is wanting to embrace Jesus without wanting to embrace the doctrine of the Trinity, mm. that that would be the biggest group. We should probably look into that. I should probably make a video you should do. on that subject about uh, that's what I'm going to do this week. I'm going to make that video and then we'll start pushing it out to just Jewish people and, and see what happens. Because honestly, I feel like that is where this is going. Yeah. I feel like once they take, I, once they take Arianism and that belief system and, and add their Jewishness to it mm. and they run with it, I feel like they'll take it over. I mean, I think that it'll be just, yeah. they'll just, it'll be growing so big. We wouldn't even be able to <laughs> how that thing just blows up. Um, what's amazing is that, um, you know, I think a lot of Jews don't join Christians because they just don't accept Trinity, which is fair enough. You know, if you're a Jew, you believe in one God, one person, he, he's he, not them, you know, and um, so they, they believe in one person. So maybe a lot of, a lot more Jews would accept Christianity, but because of the Trinity, it's an obstacle for them. It would be for me as well. If I was a Jew, I always believe in one God then i mean what's these three persons go i mean it doesn't make sense so so whereas every orthodox church we believe in one person just exactly the way they believe father yahweh god in a one god that's it and messiah the, the promised messiah from the old testament the messiah that they're waiting for you know this is exactly what we're preaching and know how easy it's it's so logical and so consistent so they will love it they will be they're gonna love it. There they are. I'm gonna make that video. I'm gonna take extra extra time to actually just address Aryan Jew, Jews. Yeah. Yeah, I would I would uh, happy. I've got a Jew friend and uh, he was an atheist actually. And uh, he he now he believes in God, but I think he's kind of he's been open, he's been to church before. So I think I've added him to our um church but he's not posted well, good so, all right i'm gonna let you guys go you got any well, questions or anything any prayer uh, requests yeah just just uh, just one question about colossians uh where it says 116 there are three versions of the translation uh one says for in him all things were created another <laughs> translation for through him god created everything and another translation is for by him all things were created. So, uh, so by him it sounds like by Jesus was created. But I think better translation is through Jesus. Do you know what I mean? So that, because that's how Arians believe. We believe that for through Jesus God created everything. Well, but, okay. So let's look at this real quick. Um, we have. We have a way of looking at this. Let me see how I do this. I'm gonna learn how to use this cameraman thing. Oh, okay. all right. Um, let's see. So when I hit this, okay. All right. So I don't know how to get that part. I'm trying to get trying to get my show up on here mm -hmm. let's see here all right anyways let me look at it so in 
in the Hebrew, I mean, the Greek, mm. it says, um, mm. so the first word uh, that or because since in, which is um, a preposition, in him, so we have in as a preposition, the, the, let's look at the word and its usage. So, oh, the, um, yeah, that's, so it's the preposition with the dative. The primary idea is within, in, within this, saying within him. So it's not saying um, your other verses, the other versions you're saying, were for in him because in him for by him you're saying by him is this version it says by him by him uh new jerusalem bible says in him um so the word is in like inside i mean the way i understand this verse i would go back to genesis uh chapter one verse one which is an unorthodox way of reading it um but for me to say in the first or in the beginning, which is Jesus, with inside of Jesus, mm -hmm. all things were created in heaven and on earth, right? That's the way I read Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, or in the first, first creation, all these things were created. So within Jesus, all these things were created. So in Jesus, in this verse, um, Colossians, I lost it for a second here. So in Colossians, Verse 15, sorry, for in Jesus, let's read it this way, for in Jesus were all things created, within him. Mm -hmm. So that's what it's saying, inside of him. And the reason that would be is because only the only creator is the Father. Mm -hmm. So the Father is the creator. He made all things alone, right? There's a verse that says that all things were made by him alone. So he made all things, including Jesus. But inside of Jesus, he put all these, all of the things that are going to be created within him. He placed them all in there, and he is bringing it out. Kind of like Adam, when Adam's getting his rib taken out and he's fashioning the woman. Out of Jesus, out of Jesus God is make, having all of these things come out of Jesus. It's not that Jesus is creating them. It's that God put them within him. And he's using him as the vessel to bring all these things out. So in him were all things created. God put all those things within him. In heaven and on earth, all those things. And then if you look at verse 17, it says that he is before all things, meaning he's existing before all And he is obviously above all things as far as authority is concerned. And, and in him, all things consist. So now all things are holding together because of Jesus. Mm -hmm. So you could say the same thing of Eve when God takes out of Adam his rib, fashions the woman. So within Adam, she is consisting. So she's consisting because she's taken out of Adam. Mm -hmm. So you could say the same thing about Eve. In her, in Adam, she consists, mm -hmm. right, Eve. So she exists because she is from Adam. So they can, she, you can say that, that Eve was, is consisting from Adam or through, or in, you could say in effect, in Adam was Eve, right? I mean, that Eve was in Adam, that it was made, she was in there already, took it out of him and fashioned her the way she's supposed to be. Same thing with Jesus. In him were all things created and all, all things consist because they're out of him. They're being taken out of him. Mm -hmm. We're one body with Christ. Remember that. That's also the same analogy. In uh, So we're one body with Christ. And then you look at Ephesians where it talks about the mystery. Um, Ephesians. Thank you. 